Chapter 13 of The Time Traders by Andre Norton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Time Traders. Chapter 13. Ross swayed against a guard, was fended off, and bounced against the wall as the man shouted words Ross could not understand. A determined roar from the leader brought a semblance of order, but it was plain that they had not been expecting this. Ross was hustled out of the room back to his cell. His guards were opening the cell door when a second shock was felt, and he was thrust into safekeeping with no ceremony. He half crouched against the questionable security of the wall, wading through two more twisting earth waves, both of which were accompanied or preceded by dull sounds. Bombing. That last wrench was really bad. Ross found himself lying on the floor, feeling tremors rippling along the earth. His stomach nodded convulsively with a fear unlike any he had ever known. It was as if the very security of the world had been jerked from under him. But that last explosion, if it was an explosion, appeared to be the end. Ross sat up gingerly after several long moments, during which no more shocks moved the floor and walls. A line of light marked the door, showing cracks where none had previously existed. Ross, not yet ready to try standing erect, was heading toward it on his hands and knees, when a sharp noise behind him brought him to a stop. There was no light to see by, but he was certain that the scrape of metal against metal sounded from the far side of the wall. He crawled back and put his ear to the surface. Now he heard not only that scraping, but an undercurrent of clicks chippings. Under his exploring hands, the surface remained as smooth as ever, however. Then suddenly, perhaps a foot from his head, there sounded a rip of metal. The wall was being holed from the other side. Ross caught a flicker of very weak light, and moving in it was the point of a tool pulling at the smooth surface of the wall. It broke away with a brittle sound, and a hand holding a light reached through the aperture. Ross wondered if he should catch that wrist, but the hope that the digger might just possibly be an ally kept him motionless. After the hand with the light whipped back beyond the wall, a wide section gave way, and a hunched figure crawled through, followed by a second. In the limited glow he saw the first tunneler clearly enough. Asha! Ross was unprepared for what followed his cry. The lean brown man moved with a panther's striking speed, and Ross was forced back. A hand like a steel ring on his throat shut the breath away from his bursting lungs. The other's muscular body held him flat in spite of his struggles. The light of the small flash glowed inches beyond his eyes as he fought to fill his lungs. Then the hand on his throat was gone, and he gasped, a little dizzy. Murdoch, what are you doing?' Ash's clipped voice was muffled by another sudden explosion. This time the earth tremors not only hurled them from their feet, but seemed to run along the walls and across the ceiling. Ross, burying his face in the crook of his arm, could not rid himself of the fear that the building was being slowly twisted into scrap. When the shock was over, he raised his head. "'What's going on?' he heard McNeil ask. "'Attack!' that was Ash. But why and by whom, don't ask me. You are a prisoner, I suppose, Murdoch? Yes, sir. Ross was glad that his voice sounded normal enough. He heard someone sigh and guessed it was McNeil. Another digging party. There was tired disgust in that. I don't understand. Ross appealed to that section of the dark where Ash had been. Have you been here all the time? Are you trying to dig your way out? I don't see how you can cut out of this glacier that we're parked under. Glacier! Ash's exclamation was as explosive as the tremors. So, we're inside a glacier. That explains it. Yes, we've been here. On ice, McNeil commented and then laughed. Glacier, ice, that's right, isn't it? We're collaborating, Ash continued supplying our dear friends with a lot of information they already have, and some flights of fancy they never dreamed about. However, they didn't know we had a few surprise packets of our own strewn about. It's amazing what the boys back at the project can pack away in a belt, 
or between layers of a hide in a boot. So we've been engaged in some research of our own." But I didn't have any escape gadgets. Ross was struck by the unfairness of that. No, Ash agreed, his voice even and cold. They are not entrusted to first-run men. You might slip up and use them at the wrong moment. However, you appear to have done fairly well." The heat of Ross's rising anger was chilled by the noise, which cracked over their heads, ground to them through the walls, flattened and threatened them. He had thought those first shocks the end of this ice burrow and the world. He knew that this one was. And the silence that followed was as threatening, in its way, as the clamor had been. Then there was a shout, a shriek. The space of light near the cell door was widening as that barrier, broken from its lock, swung open slowly. The fear of being trapped sent the men in that direction. Out! Ross was ready enough to respond to that order, but they were stopped by a crackle of sound that could have been only one thing. Rapid-fire guns. Somewhere in this warren a fight was in progress. Ross, remembering the arrogant face of the bald ship's officer, wondered if this was not an attack in force, the aliens against the looting Reds. If so, would the ship people distinguish between those found here? He feared not. The room outside was clear, but not for long. As they lay watching, two men backed in, then whirled to stare at each other. A voice roared from beyond as if ordering them back to some post. One of them took a step forward in reluctant obedience, but the other grabbed his arm and pulled him away. They turned to run, and an automatic cracked. The man nearest Ross gave a queer little cough and folded forward to his knees, sprawling on his face. His companion stared at him wildly for an instant, and then skidded into the passage beyond, escaping by inches a shot which clipped the door as he lunged through it. No one followed for outside there was a crescendo of noise, shouting, cries of pain, and unidentified hissing. Ash darted into the room, taking cover by the body. Then he came back, the fellow's gun in his hand, and with a jerk of his head summoned the other two. He motioned them on in a direction away from the sounds of battle. "'I don't get all this,' McNeil commented as they reached the next passage. "'What's going on? Mutiny?' or have our boys gotten through?" "'It must be the ship people,' Ross answered. "'What ship?' Ash caught him up swiftly. "'The big one the Reds have been looting.' "'Ship?' echoed McNeil. "'And where did you get that rig?' In the bright light it was easy to see Ross's alien dress. McNeil fingered the elastic material wonderingly. "'From the ship!' Ross returned impatiently. But if the ship people are attacking, I don't think they will notice any difference between us and the Reds. There was a burst of ear-splitting sound. For the third time, Ross was thrown from his feet. This time the burrow lights flickered, dimmed, and went out. Oh, fine, commented McNeil, bitterly out of the dark. I never did care for blind man's bluff. The transfer plate... Ross clung to his own plan of escape. If we can reach that! The light which had served Ash and McNeil in their tunneling clicked on. Since the earth shocks appeared to be over for a while, they moved on, with Ash in the lead and McNeil bringing up the rear. Ross hoped Ash knew the way. The sound of fighting had died out, so one side or the other must have gained the victory. They might have only a few moments left to pass undetected. Ross's sense of direction was fairly acute, but he could not have gone so unerringly to what he sought as Ash did. Only he did not lead them to the room with the glowing plate, and Ross stifled a protest as they came instead to a small record room. On a table were three spools of tape which Ash caught up avidly, thrusting two in the front of his baggy tunic, passing the third to McNeil. Then he sped about trying the cupboards on the walls, but all were locked. His hand falling from the last latch, Ash came back to the door where Ross waited. "'To the plate!' Ross urged. Ash surveyed the cupboards once more regretfully. 
If we could have just ten minutes here! McNeil snorted. Listen, you may yearn to be the filling in an ice sandwich, but I don't. Another shock, and we'll be buried so deep even a drill couldn't find us. Let's get out now. The kid is right about that, if we still can. Once more Ash took the lead, and they wove through ghostly rooms to what must have been the heart of the post, the transfer point. To Ross's unvoiced relief, the plate was glowing. He had been nagged by the fear that when the lights blew out, the transfer plate might also have been affected. He jumped for the plate. Neither Ash nor McNeil wasted time in joining him there. As they clung together, there was a cry from behind them, underlined by a shot. Ross, feeling Ash sag against him, caught him in his arms. By the reflected glow of the plate, he saw the red leader of the post, and behind him, his hairless face hanging oddly bodiless in the gloom, was the alien. Were those two now allies? Before Ross could be sure that he had really seen them, the racking of space-time caught him, and the rest of the room faded away. Free! Get a move on! Ross glanced across Ash's bowed shoulders to McNeil's excited face. The other was pulling at Ash, who was only half-conscious. A stream of blood from a hole in his bare shoulder soaked the upper edge of his beaker tunic, but as they steadied him between them he gained some measure of awareness and moved his feet as they pulled him off the plate. Well, they were free, if only for a few seconds, and there was no reception committee waiting for them. Ross gave thanks silently for those two small favors. But if they were now returned to the Bronze Age village, they were still in enemy territory. With Ash wounded, the odds against them were so high it was almost hopeless. Working hurriedly with strips torn from McNeil's kilt, they managed to stop the flow of blood from Ash's wound. Although he was still groggy, he was fighting, driven by the fear which whipped them all. Time was one of their foremost enemies. Ross, Ash's gun in hand, kept watch on the transfer plate, ready to shoot at anything appearing there. That will have to do, Ash pulled free from McNeil. We must move. He hesitated, then, pulling the spools of tape from his blood-stained tunic, passed them to McNeil. You'd better carry these. All right, the other answered almost absently. Move! The force of that order from Ash sent them into the corridor beyond. The plate! But the plate remained clear, and Ross noted that they must have returned to their proper time, for the walls about them were the logs and stone of the village he remembered. Somebody coming through? Should be, soon. They fled, the hide boots of the other two making only the faintest whisper of sound, Ross's foam-soled feet none at all. He could not have found the other door to the outer world, but again Ash guided them, and only once did they have to seek cover. At last they faced a barred door. Ash leaned against the wall, McNeil supporting him, as Ross pulled free the locking beam. They let themselves out into the night. Which way? McNeil asked. To Ross's surprise, Ash did not turn to the gate in the outer stockade. Instead, he gestured at the mountain wall in the opposite direction. They'll expect us to try for the valley pass, so we had better go up the slope there. That has the look of a tough climb, ventured McNeil. Ash stirred. When it becomes too tough for me, his voice was dry, I shall say so, never fear. He started out with some of his old ease of movement, but his companions closed in on either side, ready to offer aid. Ross often wondered later if they could have won free of the village on their own efforts that night. He was sure their resolution would have been equal to the attempt, but their escape would have depended upon a fabulous run of luck such as men seldom encounter. As it was, they had just reached a pool of shadow beside a small hut some two buildings away from the one they had fled, when the fireworks began. As if on signal, the three fugitives threw themselves flat. From the roof of the building at the center of the village a pencil of brilliant green light pointed straight up into the sky, 
and around that spear of radiance the roof sprouted tongues of more natural red and yellow flames. Figures shot from doors as the fire lapped down the peak of the roof. Now! In spite of the rising clamor, Ash's voice carried to his two companions. The three sprinted for the palisade, mingling with bewildered men who ran out of the other cabins. The waves of fire washed on, providing light, too much light. Ash and McNeil could pass as part of the crowd, but Ross's unusual clothing might be easily marked. Others were running for the wall. Ross and McNeil boosted Ash to the top, saw him over in safety. McNeil followed. Ross was just reaching to draw himself up when he was enveloped in a beam of light. A high, screeching call, unlike any shout he had heard, split the clamor. Frantically, Ross tried for a hold, knowing that he was presenting a perfect target for those behind. He gained the top of the stockade, looked down into a black block of shadow, not knowing whether Ash and McNeil were waiting for him or had gone ahead. Hearing that strange cry again, Ross leaped blindly out into the darkness. He landed badly, hitting hard enough to bruise, but thanks to the skill he had learned for parachuting, he broke no bones. He got to his feet and blundered on in the general direction of the mountain Ash had picked as their goal. There were others coming over the wall of the village and moving through the shadows, so he dared not call out for fear of alerting the enemy. The village had been set in the widest part of the valley. Behind its stockade the open ground narrowed swiftly, like the point of a funnel, and all fugitives from the settlement had to pass through that channel to escape. Ross's worst fear was that he had lost contact with Ash and McNeil, and that he would never be able to pick up their trail in the wilderness ahead. Thankful for the dark suit he wore, which was protective covering in the night, he twice ducked into the brush to allow parties of refugees to pass him. Hearing them speak the guttural, clicking speech he had learned from Ulfa's people, Ross deduced that they were innocent of the village's real purpose. These people were convinced that they had been attacked by night demons. Perhaps there had only been a handful of reds in that hidden retreat. Ross pulled himself up a hard climb, and pausing to catch his breath, looked back. He was not overly surprised to see figures moving leisurely about the village, examining the cabins, perhaps in search of the inhabitants. Each of those searchers was clad in a form-fitting suit that matched his own, and their bulbous, hairless heads gleamed white in the firelight. Ross was astonished to see that they passed straight through walls of flame, apparently unconcerned and unsinged by the heat. The human beings trapped in the town wailed and ran, or lay and beat their heads and hands on the ground, supine before the invaders. Each captive was dragged back to a knot of aliens near the main building. Some were hurled out again into the dark, unharmed. A few others were retained. A sorting of prisoners was plainly in progress. There was no question that the ship people had followed through into this time, and that they had their own arrangements for the Reds. Ross had no desire to learn the particulars. He started climbing again, finding the pass at last. Beyond, the ground fell away again, and Ross went forward into the full darkness of the night with a vast surge of thankfulness. Finally, he stopped, simply because he was too weary, too hungry to keep on his feet without stumbling, and a fall in the dark on these heights could be costly. Ross discovered a small hollow behind a stunted tree, and crept into it as best he could, his heart laboring against his ribs, a hot stab of pain cutting into his side with every breath he drew. He awoke all at once with the snap of a fighting man who is alert to ever-present danger. A hand lay warm and hard over his mouth and above it his eyes met McNeil's. When he saw that Ross was awake, McNeil withdrew his hand. The morning sunlight was warm about them. Moving clumsily because of his stiff, bruised body, Ross crawled out of the hollow. He looked around, but McNeil stood there alone. "'Ash?' Ross questioned him. 
McNeil, showing a haggard face covered with several days' growth of rusty brown beard, nodded his head toward the slope. Fumbling inside his kilt, he brought out something clenched in his fist and offered it to Ross. The latter held out his palm, and McNeil covered it with a handful of coarse ground grain. Just to look at the stuff made Ross long for a drink, but he mouthed it and chewed, getting up to follow McNeil down into the tree-grown lower slopes. "'It's not good,' McNeil spoke jerkily, using Beaker's speech. "'Ash is out of his head some of the time. That hole in his shoulder is worse than we thought it was, and there's always the threat of infection. This whole wood is full of people flushed out of that blasted village. Most of them, all I've seen, are natives, but they have it firmly planted in their minds now that there are devils after them. If they see you wearing that suit—' "'I know, and I'd strip if I could.' Ross agreed. But I'll have to get other clothing first. I can't run bare in this cold. That might be safer, McNeil growled. I don't know just what happened back there, but it certainly must have been plenty. Ross swallowed a very dry mouthful of grain and then stooped to scoop up some leftover snow in the shadow of a tree root. It was not as refreshing as a real drink, but it helped. You said Ash is out of his head. What do we do for him, and what are your plans?" We have to reach the river somehow. It drains to the sea, and at its mouth we are supposed to make contact with the sub. The proposal sounded impossible to Ross, but so many impossible things had happened lately he was willing to go along with the idea, as long as he could. Gathering up more snow, he stuffed it into his mouth before he followed the already disappearing McNeil. End of chapter 13